Hello, world. This is the CS50 Podcast. My name is David Malin. My name is Brian Yu. And it's been a while since our last episode, but that's only because Brian and I and CS50's whole team have been rather busy here in Cambridge and in New Haven, uh, teaching the fall version of CS50 on campus at Harvard and Yale. But we're back now, and we thought we'd begin the coming year but with a discussion of how the past fall went. Indeed, the story really begins back in June of 2019, the start of summer here in Cambridge, when we gather the team together for so-called Summer 50, a retreat where we all go away together for a few days to discuss the coming summer's projects, the coming fall's changes, and really the coming year's curriculum for CS50, CS50X, CS50 AP. And the theme that we decided to focus on back in June of this past year was Echa Palante, to move forward, to evolve the course, to change and make a real thoughtful reformulation of what it is we wanted to do and what it is we wanted to teach in the class. And that led to a whole list of changes that we actually announced uh, toward the tail end of this past summer by a CS50's Medium blog uh, titled H.A. Palante as well. It's kind of amazing looking through this list just like how many changes there were that we were trying to put into effect this year. Like it feels like the course definitely changes from year to year, but this year especially it feels like there were a lot of new parts to the class and things that we were just doing differently. Yeah, absolutely. This was probably in the 13 years that I at least have been helming the class, probably the most significant overhaul of the course's structure and curriculum um, and design really. So we thought we'd share some of the thinking behind what those changes were, uh, I'll do a bit of debrief as to how we think things went and highlight not only the successes we think, but really some failures, things that we thought were a good idea in June of 2019, but didn't really pan out as we'd hoped. So lectures, for years have they been one of the defining characteristics of the course insofar as they're designed to introduce the week's concepts, particularly those concepts that students need for application on the course's problem sets or programming assignments. And in recent years, it's worth noting that attendance here in Cambridge in person on campus really has been declining. And this is not in and of itself problematic. And indeed, we, the class, and I philosophically have very much been in favor of what we call here on campus simultaneous enrollment, the ability for students to enroll not only only in CS50, but maybe even in some other class on campus that meets at the same or an overlapping time, the implication of which is that they have to physically choose to go to one class or the other. Insofar as CS50's materials have long been filmed and we place such emphasis on the quality of the digital materials, we have been comfortable in telling students, go to the other class and watch CS50 in person. However, this has of course had the side effect, uh, quite causally, of relatively few students attending the course's lectures in person, even after just a few weeks of the class. Case in point, I think in fall 2018, we had maybe 150, 200 students out of nearly 800 physically attending by only the third or so week of class. And I don't think that's really specific to CS50. Like I feel like all across Harvard and probably universities more generally, like if there's a way for students to watch lecture from the comfort of their home without showing up, there's gonna be much fewer people that actually end up showing up to those lectures. Yeah, that's quite fair. Certainly in computer science and other fields here on campus, there's a longstanding tradition of filming classes um, and that it certainly has value insofar as students can review material. If they miss material, they can catch up. But indeed, I do think we see students walking literally with their feet uh, out elsewhere. When well, I'm curious, to... when you were in college, were any of your classes filmed and did you go to class or were you more of the watch the video? Oh, I was super uptight and always the one going to class. I don't know if I ever missed I, I can think of a class whose sections I missed. Uh, I'll, I'll admit that I realized halfway during the term that an economics class I was taking actually had sections, which somehow <laughs> I forgot about. But I went to all of my CS lectures and sections. Um, and at the, at the time, if you missed a class back in what, 1995 to 1999, uh, you could go to the library for some classes and ask to borrow the VHS tape, which you could <laughs> then watch on a machine there. Uh, although I did take a networking class at Harvard, I think in probably 1997, taught by Professor H.T. Kung, who's still on the faculty here in computer science. And he was, to my knowledge, the first professor to uh, stream his course's lectures online. So it wasn't live streaming, but it used this, a technology, Microsoft NetShow, I think it was. So this is well before we had the sort of YouTube and MP4s and all streaming technologies of today. And we actually, in a tiny window that was probably like 160 pixels wide, uh, were able to watch lectures from home if we wanted. Wow, it seems we've made a lot of progress since then. Indeed, a lot more pixels since streaming then. now. But in any case, um, this is something that we have been 
uh, encouraging or certainly allowing and endorsing, but I do feel in recent years, and certainly last year when we saw these numbers, that too many students, I think, were sort of following in the footsteps of their classmates without necessarily making an informed decision themselves as to what would be best for them to learn the material. I think too many first years, so freshmen, who had just arrived on campus, who had spent the past four years, presumably in high school, going to classes, and now were suddenly stopping because they saw more upperclassmen doing uh, the same, was probably not the ideal informed decision. And ultimately, it was just having a ripple effect, I dare say. Like CS50 has such an operation behind it in terms of so many teaching fellows and so many sections and so many office hours that if a student does not go to lecture and then for whatever reason ends up not watching the lecture live or on demand later on in the evening or even the next day, it means they show up at our on-campus sections led by the teaching fellows unprepared for that section. And then they dive into the problem set and they're unprepared for the course's material. And then they come to office hours and then they ask us questions for which they should have been prepared had they been prepared for section and prior to that in person in lecture. So it really had an operational cost, I dare say, which then cost other students uh, in so far as we had fewer resources to answer their questions. Yeah, and I really noticed that. I think that really improved this year. It felt like in section, in office hours, like students came to them prepared having been to lecture, whereas normally a lot of students would wait until later in the weekly cycle in order to actually watch the lecture and begin to engage with the material. So it was just more time to be able to think about things, to take the pace of the problem sets a little more comfortably, just to make the week a little more manageable. I'm really glad to hear that, because that, of course, was our, our hope that we would actually have this ripple effect in a positive way on subsequent support structures. And oh my god, it's so liberating as a teacher to be able to say something or repeat something for a student and be able to assume that they were there the first time so that you can draw contextual references and put things into context. Whereas in years past, there was maybe a 25% chance that a student in talking with them had been to the most recent lecture. So I dare say this change uh, that we rolled out, which was quite simply to effectively require attendance at lecture. Uh, the course had some nine lectures in total in person this year, and the expectation was that students attend at least the first eight of those, which is not all that unreasonable. There are a couple of hours a week, it's only eight lectures, and so that felt like a reasonable compromise, even though philosophically, I, I dare say I lean more libertarian in that students should be free to do what they want, but I do think it was a net positive to try to help students help themselves by effectively requiring attendance. But even that, keeping track of who was at attendance was non-trivial. Oh, yeah. You were we, instrumental in solving this. Yeah, we spent weeks trying to figure <laughs> out, like, how do you take attendance for a class this big? Like, a lot of other classes, you can do the, like, just call off all the names and mark check marks, but that's not going to work in a class with 800 students. So we had to go through a lot of different possible options. All the students here have ID cards, and you can think about different ways of trying to swipe them or try to scan them. But even swiping them is going to take a long time if you yeah. only have one swipe for like 800 different people. All of whom arrive in the five minutes before class is supposed to begin, of right, course. Right, exactly, yeah, and you wanna make sure that it doesn't have a huge bottleneck and a long line. So we eventually settled on a, a system where we have these like four scanners, the type of scanners that you might see like at a, at a grocery store checkout when they're scanning the barcodes on uh, various items. We laser scan scanners. The bar yeah, laser scanners, scanning the barcodes on the ID cards. Uh, and we had four of them at different entrances to the lecture hall. Uh, and that tended to work pretty well well, I think. It was um, pretty fast. Yeah, there were a couple of lines that built up right as lecture is starting, but generally it worked pretty quickly and we were able to get people inside. Well, I'm, I'm so glad it worked out because it's a slippery slope. We had talked about writing our own custom software and how you go about attaching some kind of scanner to a tiny device, whether it's an iPod or an iPhone or maybe a Raspberry Pi, and there just felt like it would be fraught with with technical support challenges. If something went wrong, you're sort of dead in the water. But these things are pretty dummy proof. They're meant to be used, uh, we saw, for like warehousing applications, someone going up and down an aisle, presumably taking inventory. Yeah, I think that was that's intended use case, and it works pretty well when you're trying to scan a lot of things very quickly. So for our use case, I think it was a pretty good choice. Yeah, and so to incentivize students to come, because it's not a rote requirement that you come to lecture, but it's an expectation, we actually did for the first time, really, though we saw some prior incarnations of this idea uh, in experimental form in past years, um, essentially had a participation portion of students' grade, where you get it all if you meet all expectations coming to section 
and coming to lectures as well. Um, but it's amazing. I mean, it's amazing to me that not only asking students to come to lecture, but incentivizing it as with some fairly small numbers of points toward one's final grade, it worked wonders. We went from like 200 some odd students to 650 consistently week after week. I was amazed. Every time you guys took attendance or reported back after the scanners were done it being used, like it was around 650 every week. So does it feel any different when you're lecturing in front of 600 people as opposed to a much smaller oh, audience? Oh, big time. You feel more pressure when there are that many people there? Oh, live, yeah. Or? No, I, I, you, we have photographic evidence. I sweat every lecture <laughs> this year. Whereas in the past, I actually wonder, I used to blame the temperature in, in Cambridge and the lack of uh, strong air conditioning in the building. But I think it's my nerves, my heart rate. And I should probably check my Apple Watch's history of my heart rate uh, during that 3 to 5 p.m. slot on Mondays. Um, to see uh, if that partly explains. But yeah, no, I was much more nervous. You know as well as anyone how much more I and we prepared before each lecture um, because you just have so many more eyes on you. Uh, and it's it good pressure in a way. And the energy is just so much better. We had many more volunteers. There was more audience participation, both in terms of questions and answers. And when you have the occasional applause or laughter, it's sort of infectious in a good way. And it actually does motivate, I think, the experience of coming to lecture. So we didn't want people there just for the sake of being there. We wanted them to have a, hopefully an inspiring or at least an eye-opening experience. And I think you can pull that off like eight times a semester. I, I would not want us to do what we did some 13 years ago and have three lectures a week so that we now have some 30 classes that students have to attend in person beyond the sort of upfront cost of setting up for and striking uh, our AV setup for each of those lectures. I just don't think you need 30 times together to sort of feel that shared community experience like eight or thereabouts feels reasonable. Yeah, I think so. And I, student, it's nice because students get to get to know each other based on the people they're sitting next to and they can have conversations about the material, which you just can't do as well if you're just yeah. at your desk alone watching the lecture video. Well, especially for first years, theoretically, maybe you even rub shoulders with more people that you meet and then stay in touch with more than you would if you were just in the library or at home watching on your laptop. Now, we should concede that we also changed the day of lectures this past year. The past couple of years, we've been using Fridays, or at least last year we did, and it was Friday mornings of all things. I think it was 9, 9 a.m. officially to 11.45, though we typically started a little later, closer to 9.45, so that we still had a two-hour window. And we know statistically from CS50's own data and Harvard College's own data, Friday is hands down the least popular day for classes, both among students and reportedly among faculty. It's hard enough to get students awake in the morning, <laughs> let alone Friday mornings. And let alone David and, and the team. But, but we steered toward Friday because of exactly this. It was wide open on Sanders Theater's schedule, which meant we had the ability to book the room the entire day, which is great for CS50's production team because they arrive some 6 a.m. for a 9 a.m. or 9.45 a.m. class just to set up the AV equipment and technology and test everything. So there's a huge amount of setup. And so just having that runway was liberating. Plus, theoretically and tragically, it didn't work out this way. You'd think more students would be free on Friday mornings, 9 a.m. because statistically they don't have conflicts or other classes and there probably aren't extracurriculars going on at that hour. But there was a lot of sleeping or non-attending going on at that hour, too. Yeah, a lot of students just tried to, like, free up your Friday. Like, it was a goal among many of my friends' senior year to, like, try and arrange your schedule so you didn't have to go anywhere on Friday. And people tried to take it easy that day. Yeah, they were very successful at that in fall 2018. So, mm -hmm. in short, I think this was a net positive, I dare say. I think the lectures and hopefully the audiences, the students' engagement with them was so much more positive and experiential this year than in past years. Hopefully we really did set students up for more success each week insofar as they now had gone to lecture and therefore went to section prepared and then went to office hours or didn't go to office hours because they didn't necessarily have as many questions and ultimately succeeded to the problem sets because they had all of those building blocks ready ready for them. And without jumping ahead too much, I think it's fair. I, th I would like to think, although there's many other factors that we should discuss someday, CS50's grades ultimately skewed higher this year um, on the course's problem sets. And we think this might be for a few reasons, but I would like to think that one of the reasons was that we actually set students up for a better educational experience simply by incentivizing, motivating, expecting that they take advantage of the resources that, that frankly have always been there, but were perhaps being underutilized. Yeah, that would be nice. I hope so. I certainly <laughs> hope that's the case. <laughs> Me too, me too. Well, this wasn't the only change, certainly, and we hypothesized that by moving CS50's lectures uh, to Monday afternoons and not having sections until Tuesdays and Wednesdays, that allowed us Monday evenings to even provide students with an opportunity 
for review. And this is a term we keep deploying in different forms for several years, but this year's super section took a new and improved form. Yeah, so the goal of the super sections, which were kind of new this year, were to be an opportunity for students after lecture, after they've had a little bit of time to think about things, have some dinner, to come back and ask questions about that day's material. Because after the lecture, the problem sets immediately release, so theoretically students could begin to work on it. Um, but oftentimes in a, in a long lecture where a lot of topics are covered, uh, not all students are going to get a chance to ask all of the questions that they might have, especially in a class as big as CS50. Uh, so one of the hopes, I think, of the super sections was to just be a chance for students to uh, sign in virtually in a virtual classroom. We use Zoom, which is like a video conferencing tool to do it. and. Uh, Students could sign in, and then I would lead these weekly super sections where students could ask questions. I would show some additional examples based on the lecture material, uh, just to give students um, some more opportunities for Q&A and some more opportunities to really get a firmer understanding in that day's lecture material in preparation for that week's quiz, but also in preparation for that week's problem set. Um, Overall, I feel like they were very helpful for the students who were there, like they got mm -hmm. their questions answered, and there were always a lot of questions that students did have. Um, they weren't super well attended. I'd say maybe we had anywhere from 15 to 30 people on any given week. Um, I think part of that is probably just you've already been to a two-hour lecture on Monday, and now that's another hour plus on a Monday evening. Uh, maybe it was overlapping with some people's dinner or other extracurricular commitments. Yeah. Um, but I do think that on the whole, for students who attended it, it was helpful. And we made the recordings available to students afterwards. So even if you weren't able to attend in person, you could review them later. And I know some students did that for preparation for the exams and that type of thing. Yeah. And I do think, I, I as you know, was such a fan of the idea of trying out Zoom or video conferencing more generally for this, because if you decrease the friction for students being able to access something like this, right, they don't on campus have to walk 15 minutes to get there. They don't have to walk 15 minutes after, especially if they only have one or few questions. You would think that many students wouldn't be availing themselves of resources if there's too high of a, a operational cost to them or too much friction between them and the resource. But I was disappointed, honestly. Like It is great for the 15, 30 or so students that, that attended, and it was often a recurring group of students. We saw some familiar faces yeah, many definitely. weeks. But I don't know. I mean, out of 800 students on campus, 100 plus through Harvard Extension School is 15 to 30 out of 900-ish. A success or a failure, do you think, for something like this? I think it's probably too small to really call it a success because it was a fair amount of time investment that yeah. the production staff had to be there in order to make it work and to post-produce the video and make it available online. Um, and so I'm not sure. Now, granted, part of it may be that there were just other avenues that students had to ask questions. It's not one of our intended changes that we originally reported here. Um, but we started working with a, a new question and answer software tool called Ed uh, this fall for the first time that just, I think, was a much nicer interface for students to be able to quickly ask questions and get feedback from the staff. And I feel like a lot of students ended up using that tool as a way of asking questions too. So maybe that was another avenue that yeah, students found as fair. an opportunity to ask questions. Would you be inclined to have us nix them the coming year, do you think? Uh, it's a good question. I think right now I would probably lean against doing the super sections, at least in the same form that we did them this past fall, because yeah. it didn't seem like they were nearly high enough impact. Um, but the super sections have evolved a little bit over time. Like two years ago, they were uh, in person, but they weren't every week, and they were just on the weeks when we thought the students would have needed them, and then attendance was a little bit higher. Uh, so maybe I wouldn't keep them in their current form, um, but maybe there's some changes we can make. And I'd be curious to hear what like feedback from students is later about them. Yeah, absolutely. And we did survey students throughout the semester, so we have some good data there. Yeah. But this is a, a, a concept, super section, so larger than life sections, uh, where we've tried for years to get these off the ground successfully. And they always have been this sort of middling success. And I remember some 10 years ago when these super sections were only in person, I think by the end of the year, we had one student <laughs> attending at the end. But, you know, fun fact, she went on to be our head teaching fellow for three years. So uh, it's a wonderful recruiting mechanism, it seems, to see who's really, really passionate about the material. Mm -hmm. And another one of the goals of the super section, at least this year, was because it was the first year that we had weekly quizzes, which I do want to ask you about. Um, the super sections were designed to be an opportunity to yeah. help get some question and answer, get understanding of the material to, in order to allow students to be able to to work on those quizzes. So I did want to ask you about, about those quizzes. Like what was the motivation in your mind behind them and how do you feel like that went around this semester? Yeah, really good question. So CS50 for many years has had a tradition of either 
quizzes or tests or which are really just midterms in some form and the the format of them has evolved over time but in recent years they've taken the form of sort of thought-based short answers questions that aren't really regurgitative of recent material from the class they really are meant to pluck up uh, pick up some idea and take it further than class time allowed for or frankly just introduce some new topic altogether and so this year's quizzes, which were weekly Google form based small assessments, two or three questions that we gave to students after each lecture due the next morning, the idea being we wanted them to submit these quizzes after they had attended or if need be watched lecture. We wanted them to submit them before they attended section so that they were thereby with higher probability arriving prepared for section. And also, honestly, we also wanted to use them as a distribution vector for the types of questions that we didn't really have much time for in other windows during the term. We only had time in terms of the academic calendar this year for one test, whereas in some years we've had two such tests or two quizzes or the like. And we wanted to be able to integrate some kind of short answer questions throughout the course that don't necessarily belong in a coding based problem set. These really are different types of assessments and they're not even just assessments. They were meant to be uh, also instructive in some form. So they ended up, I think, by design, and I was complicit in this, probably being a little more evaluative of the previous material. I think we tended to cherry pick relatively accessible topics in large part because we knew students had only just seen the material. They hadn't yet had an opportunity to review necessarily or think about it or apply it in a problem set. So I don't think I was I was in love with the types of questions we asked, but as a mechanism for incentivizing preparation for section, I do think they were successful. I mean, students were putting in the time and if there was any design flaw besides the, the, the ideal questions, I wish we had a, been able to ask was really just the time frame. Um, I think if a student finishes CS50 at 5 p.m., even if they're there in person, then they go off to dinner, then maybe they have a commitment or they certainly might have work in other classes. Not much room in the evening to actually fit it in before the deadline. But of course, our section started on Tuesdays around uh, noontime. And so we wanted them to submit in advance. So I think my takeaway is they're worth trying. I think they were uh, sufficiently successful, but I think we need to give students a slightly wider window of time. Yeah, it is tricky just how... I wish there was more time in the week to be able to like have an extra day or something where we could in order to make room for this type of thing. Because I do think it was a good thing that the sections were earlier. In the past, last year, you mentioned that the lectures were on Friday. And because that was at the end of the week, it meant realistically most sections didn't happen until Monday, which meant we sort of lost that weekend of time. Mm. This year, I thought it was actually a really big improvement that right after lecture on Monday, section started on Tuesday, yeah. which meant very early on in this weekly cycle of lecture, then section, then problem set, uh, students were able to see some more examples, get some more practice, and then really feel like they had the ability to go forth and actually start working on the problem set earlier than they would have been able to last year. And I think that was a really good thing, but it also meant less time for the quiz. We really need an extra day at least between Monday and Tuesday. So if anyone out there is listening, we need an eight day week and then CS50 would be, would be better. Well, so sections two, we have taken varying approaches to over the past few years. And this year, we've uh, continued to expect attendance, which was something that we rolled out a couple of years ago. And we also tried to make them more hands on because a, a recurring bit of feedback from students is really that they don't have much time or much opportunity between lectures and PSETs to really apply what was in lecture, but then is expected of them in PSETs. So how successful do you think this was overall with the team? Yeah, this is a really common piece of feedback. So every semester after CS50 is over, I go through and read our Q evaluations. The Q evaluations are Harvard's uh, student evaluations of the courses where students answer a whole bunch of questions about things they liked about the class, things they didn't like. And we go through and we read this every semester to see like what is the general feedback and a big piece of feedback about the sections was like I really like my section leader but it feels like section is just a, a rehash of lecture it feels mm. like we're going over the same topics from lecture um, and there were a couple of reasons why that might have been the case one is that last year a lot of students came to section having not watched the lecture yeah. and so as a result of that more of section ended up having to be like let's go through the lecture material again uh, to make sure that no one feels totally lost during mm -hmm. the course of the section so I think one improvement this year is that because we could assume with higher probability that students were actually at section, uh, that the sections were able to be a little bit more interesting. We didn't have to rehash what happened in lecture and we could actually go forward a little bit. But another common piece of feedback was students saying that they wished uh, they had more opportunity in section 
to actually try things hands-on, that it felt like they understood things conceptually in lecture, but then struggled when it came to working on the problem set to be able to know how to actually write the code to implement what they had in their mind. And I think that's a, a common struggle in computer science. Mm -hmm. You can understand a concept or an algorithm in theory and conceptually, and when someone draws a diagram about it, but when it comes time to actually start writing the code, like that can introduce new challenges and it can be tricky uh, in ways that you might not have expected before. So one of my big goals with sections and what I was trying to work with a lot of the teaching fellows about was making sections very hands-on, to be able to talk about topics, but really to give students opportunities to work through practice problems, to try approaching problems in different ways, to let them work in pairs together as they tried to write code to solve smaller problems, not as big as a problem set, but still related concepts that were going to come up on the problem set, just to give students practice with taking a problem, formulating an idea in their head, and actually writing the code uh, to be able to solve it. And I think that uh, ended up working really, really well. That um, for a lot of students for whom CS50 is their first exposure to computer science and to programming, just that little bit of extra practice with someone there to help guide you and to, to point you in the right direction if you find yourself lost or struggling, that that adds a little bit of confidence. That you feel like, oh, you can solve these smaller problems. And now this larger problem set maybe is a little bit uh, less intimidating. Well, I'm really glad to hear because this is something we've been trying for years. And it's such a simple thing, the fact that students are more prepared, at least theoretically for class, that that makes a difference. But hopefully we're getting even the, the finer points just right now, too. Yeah, and it, I feel like in just talking to students, they seem to anecdotally enjoy their sections and feel like they were getting things out of it. Um, our course evaluations for this semester haven't come out yet for the college. I think they're supposed to come out next week or so, but I'll be curious to read those and just see what all the feedback is about sections and lectures and all the other uh, changes that have been happening this semester. Yeah, absolutely. Well, and another big one, too, was really the third of the primary curricular support structures for students known as office hours, which for us take the form of one-on-one -on -one opportunities for help with the course's problem set. And over the years, we've offered these in different forms, usually several days or evenings of the week. We have reserved some locations on campus, whether it's a computer lab or dining hall or library for students to drop in with their laptops and ask questions of the course's staff. And we usually have a, multiple members of the staff, teaching fellows and course assistants, there to answer questions. But you know, for as long as I've been teaching CS50 and frankly, probably taking CS50 back in the day, have office hours been one of the greatest challenges of scale with a class of CS50 size? Because even though we throw as many resources as we can, as best we can, it, invariably there's a line, there's a weight, and it's significant sometimes. I mean, we have quantitative data over the years where some years students were waiting at least an hour just to get their question answered. And if you liken this to the real world, where maybe Maybe you go to a store and you're waiting for help from someone or you call someone on the phone or open a chat window to get technical support. I mean, that's the same kind of experience. And these are students in an academic environment just trying to ask questions and clear up some confusions. It's been really hard to keep up with the load. So this year, we tried to rethink these fundamentally, and we have tried for so many years to gather students in one big place, like a dining hall or, or a library, and a lot of members of the staff, sometimes 10 or 20 or even 30 plus members of the staff all at once. But even then, we've never really achieved an optimal ratio of staff to students. And if you think about it, even if you have as good of a ratio, seemingly good, as like one to five, one teaching fellow to five students, even if that teaching fellow spends only 10, 12 minutes with each student, it's going to take them an hour just to get back around to the first student again. So that's the sort of um, uh, sense of the problem here. So we rolled out tutorials. And tutorials for us were opportunities to for students to sign up for office hours, quite simply by appointment. And we uh, capped attendance at these tutorials at five, maybe six students, the idea of which was even though that's not necessarily an ideal ratio, we remove students from the stressors of, from the pressures of, from the chaos of these larger spaces that frankly were all too conducive in a bad way to stress and rising uh, stress levels. And we spread them out on campus in offices and conference rooms and dorm rooms and dining halls. And what do you think? How did they go? I think they were an improvement. And the word you used before, like the chaos, I think that was a good word to describe what office hours were like 
in, in past years that a student shows up to office hours and there are just so many other students that are all trying to get help at the same time and there's a limited number of staff that are themselves stressed because they're trying to balance between everyone. Uh, there was a staff member who, uh, who took the class last year and when uh, I was talking to her about what her office hours experience was like as we were talking about office hours this year, uh, she said to me, uh, last year it felt like going to office hours was like going to war and you would like show up and you would have to like fight against all these other students in order to get a couple minutes of attention from one of the staff staff members. Um, and that just wasn't healthy for anyone. I don't think it was healthy yeah. for the students or the staff members. No, I used to be terrified of Thursday nights <laughs> when problem sets were due on Fridays. Yeah. And I think the tutorials just, they feel so much calmer. Like the, the ratio is one to five and we eventually had to change it to one to six just because demand for them was so high, which I think is a testament to students valuing the help that they got at these tutorials. Um, but going to a room where there's just four or five other students just feels way healthier than going to a room where there's a hundred people all trying to get help at the same time uh, well, that from the was same our, small group of people. That was certainly our hope that you could, the fact that the teaching fellow was just a few feet away and not a few tables away just meant that you knew sort of socially that they're going to get to you shortly. Even if it is maybe 10 or so minutes, it just doesn't feel the same. And yet tragically, I mean, there was motivation for our larger scale office hours, so to speak, especially in the dining halls and office hours. One, we originally hoped that they would just be much more social and much more interesting than the basement of Harvard Science Center where they once were back in yesteryear. Um, but two, there's just an economy of scale, right? With a one to six ratio in some corner of campus, there's arguably an inefficiency. And if there's some quiet time or lull time, that teaching fellow is just kind of standing there or waiting there, not actually helping anyone. Whereas in the library or dining hall, if there were a student at the other table, that TF could wander off and go help them. So I do think in theory, the larger scale office hours were a better allocation of resources, but it came with a lot of negative externalities. Yeah, and there was also the benefit of having many staff members in the same place. Like one common thing, yeah. uh, with struggle with the tutorials is there's one staff member with five students. And as a result of that, if a staff member is struggling with something, in the larger office hours where there's a lot of staff there, the staff member can turn to another TF and ask them for their input or multiple eyes can be on the same piece of code to try and help things together. Um, it was, I think, a greater challenge for the staff to lead these tutorials. I think they're harder to lead than office hours because there's a lot more independence involved in them, that you need to be able to solve problems on your own um, because there isn't always going to be a whole bunch of other staff that you can turn to at that particular time. Yeah. So. Well, we did try to mitigate that by co-locating some of the tutorials so that in the same room or same building, there were two groups of five to six students and one or two TFs. Do you have a sense of whether that indeed helped by just having two smart people in the same room instead of just one? I think that does help. And I think as much as possible trying to pair people up um, is useful for just being able to bounce ideas off someone else and to do a little bit of that efficient allocation of resources where if there's a lull in one area a staff member can go to another area in order to help students there too um, but it's not quite the same as having a lot of staff in the same place and being able to brainstorm things together because there are definitely issues that are tricky enough that I remember like standing around a computer with two or three other staff members on a particularly tricky bug or something that none of us could quite figure out for a little bit of time until we really thought about it together. Um, and so I think there are definitely trade-offs, but I think on the whole, these tutorials have been much healthier uh, yeah. than the office hours and just a better experience for students. Yeah, no, this one's a keeper in my mind. This is Agreed. one of the best yeah, new changes we sure. did. And yet I think it's only fair that we admit we were a little nervous at best, terrified at worst that these were going to blow up on us in that we knew that even though we have a teaching team of some 80 teaching fellows and course assistants for our 800 some odd students, there was not going to be enough slots during a week for everyone to sign up for a tutorial if they want. We were kind of banking on the fact that numerically, based on the number of people we wanted to have maximally at a tutorial and based on the number of tutorials maximally that we wanted to expect of our teaching staff for e each week so that they balance their other responsibilities and their other classes, we couldn't handle 100% uptake of tutorials. We could only handle roughly 50%. But we we, um, we we eked by, and I think you noted that we increased the capacity from five to six. Not a huge problem, um, but that definitely speaks to, I do think, the, the uptake and the, 
the success of them. Yeah, I'm looking at the numbers here and just we recorded the attendance at all of these tutorials so we could look back at the end of the semester and see like how many people were actually showing up to tutorials as compared to office hours. And in week one, it looks like about 200 students signed up for office hour, or for tutorials rather. Uh, in the second week, it was like 380 or so. In the third week, it was 500. The next <laughs> week, it was 650. So they became more and more popular week after week after week. And so around the midpoint of the semester, I was definitely starting to get a little bit nervous <laughs> about how many signups we were having and we only have so many staff that can only work so many hours and so there's only so much help we can provide at these yeah. tutorials um, but ultimately I think it ended up working out well well and thanks to you we had a special tool for this too because we needed some mechanism via which students could sign up for these tutorials so Brian kindly whipped up a web-based tool that students log into and then they click a button next to the day and time and location that they want to sign up for and it also had the benefit of capping attendance so that only five or six people could sign up for a given tutorial but there's interesting sociological things that we discussed over time too because it was not uncommon for students just to be no-shows or to email us at the last minute and say they couldn't make it and this was actually a hard problem because here we had a scarce resource that we were trying desperately to ensure was being efficiently allocated to as many students as possible and the fact that a student might sign up for one of six, five or one of six slots and then not show or cancel at the last minute such that there's no time for someone else to take it was really frustrating and it was hard to sort of deal with. And students were often apologetic, but I'm not sure some of them appreciated that this was a resource you're effectively taking away from someone else because we were at capacity, certainly mid-semester. Yeah, I don't know if it was it's totally apparent to students just how scarce the resource necessarily was. That if you're signing up for something where there is no cap, maybe you feel like, oh, it doesn't matter if I don't show yeah, up. that's fair. Um, but yeah, with the tutorials, it is, it is different. And it was always unfortunate when uh, a student didn't show up and another student probably wanted that time and they yeah. were only available at that particular hour. Um, and so weren't able to attend as a result. Well, and here I dare say was an opportunity for us, a, a teachable moment. And what we actually tried doing and software helped with this was we uh, prevented the student who was a no-show and who did not give us enough time to reschedule someone else. Uh, we prevented them from signing up from a future tutorial until they took a moment to email us the course's heads uh, just to sort of ask that that hold be lifted. The idea being to sort of send a social message and also hopefully an educational one that like, hey, okay, something must have come up, life happens, that's fine, but you need to handle this differently. And I think it would be interesting to look retrospectively at the data to see just how frequently was the same person a no-show and to see if we actually had some positive impact here on expectations. Yeah, I haven't yet looked at that data, but I have a feeling, like I can't remember too many multiple no-shows where we had to um, remove the ability to sign up for tutorials multiple times for the same person. I can take another look at the data, but that'd be an interesting uh, question that I'd like to get the answer to. Yeah. Well, shall we move on to one of our biggest failures? All right, go for it. So I was such a fan in June of 2019 and for the months after that of what we called code reviews ultimately. The idea being not only in academia, but the real world sitting down with someone or digitally corresponding with someone about the quality of your code and getting typed or verbal feedback about what you could have done better or differently or otherwise with your code. We in CS50 have of course experimented with different forms of feedback over the years. Correctness, which is now automated style, which is now automated and design, which is historically was done by humans, but this year we deliberately eliminated the quote unquote design feedback from student scores in large part because one, uh, analysis of past data that we'd collected say in fall 2018 suggested that the numbers we were assigning to students design scores really weren't influencing their final grades as a result, but the cost operationally to providing that design feedback was huge. Of the 12 plus hours a week that one of our teaching fellows might work on CS50 and work with their students, they were spending upwards of six or more hours alone on grading. This is an isolated activity for many of them. It's heads down in front of the laptop, spending hours on end uh, providing feedback to students. And then we knew moreover quantitatively from um, uh, that students were barely engaging with this, con with this feedback and sometimes weren't even looking at it, which really called into question. So while undoubtedly I do think there is value to providing very precise feedback when it comes to the design of some student's code, what could they do better and why, the reality is, and I think we made the right call, reallocating the teaching fellow's time to more tutorials or more office hours or more inhuman time, uh, uh, human time in person, not inhuman time, 
is was probably a net positive given a finite number of hours in the day. Yeah, I think so. And I remember the frustration of like having to do hours and hours of grading and then students not reading any of that feedback as that I spent a whole lot of time working on. Uh, it just felt like an inefficient use of my time if I'm spending all this time and students aren't yeah. actually reading any of that feedback. And so this year, fall 2019, we introduced code reviews. The idea was that alongside the course's tutorials for which students could sign up, you could also via the website sign up for one or more code reviews for feedback from a live human uh, via video conferencing to make things easy and in and out, uh, to get feedback on your most recent submission of a problem set. The idea being to still provide on an opt-in basis as much design feedback as students would like on their code, but more tailored to the students who actually did want it. Unfortunately, roughly how many students would you say wanted it? I think we got maybe two or three <laughs> signups in any given week out of a class of 800 plus students. Yeah, this was a big fail. I think it was a wonderful idea in spirit, but I can only surmise that conflicting demands on students' time, the fact that this is optional, the fact that this is opt-in, maybe the fact that it was by design on video was just a bit strange, even though that meant they could pop in, spend a few time, a few minutes talking with a staff member and pop out, um, was theoretically a compelling thing, but in practice, it just flopped. Yeah, I think part of it is that it was totally optional, and much like the super sections were optional, when it's optional, there's just much less engagement. And the other piece of it, I think, if I just had to guess, I don't have any data to back this up, but I think it's just a matter of the context switching, that when a week ends, a lot of students, you go to another lecture, you want to yeah. focus on the next week, and the code reviews are the only part of the week that really aren't focused on that week, they're focused on the previous week. It's looking back at the work you did last week, which is a valuable thing to do, to learn how to do things yeah. better, um, but in a academic semester that just moves so quickly week after week after week, not only in CS50, but in other classes, I think it's a challenge to get students to opt into engaging with stuff in the past. Yeah, I agree. And here too, if anyone's listening, if we could have twice as many weeks, we could then have an on week and an off week. Uh, because truly, I think pedagogically, that would be the ideal. After submitting some work, you have an evaluative process, a feedback loop, even an opportunity maybe for students to work on further and resubmit the previous week's problem set so as to just get better at it and then actually take into account actively uh, that feedback as opposed to just passively looking at or hearing it. So we'll try again, but rest in peace, code reviews. They won't return next year in this form. Shall we turn finally to perhaps the other biggest change this year, which was the course's notion of tracks in which you and a few others were instrumental? Yeah, so this was a really big change to the real structure of the curriculum of the course. Um, the course for a long time has had the last couple of weeks be focused on web programming, where students learn HTML to build web pages, and they uh, use Python in order to build web applications, and we add a little bit of JavaScript and CSS on top of that as well. Um, and one of the effects of that we found was that the, a lot of students' final projects when it came time for the CS50 Fair were all very, very similar. There were a lot of web applications that all looked fairly similar. Um, and a couple of students would take it upon themselves to try to teach themselves how to do something different, how to do something with hardware or how to build an iOS app, for example. But it definitely wasn't a lot. And we thought that maybe part of that was just the fact that because we teach how to build web applications, that we sort of inadvertently push students towards building web applications for their final project, even though there are a lot of other options that students could pursue mm. as interesting things that they might find fun to build on their own or in a group. Um, so the tracks were a change we made to the curriculum this year, where we actually gave students a choice of what they want to do with the last two weeks of their semester. Instead of just pushing everyone into web programming, we said you could pick what you would like to study for the last two weeks. You can pick web programming, you can pick uh, mobile app development with either iOS or um, for Android using Java, or you could pick game development if that was something of interest to you. And we had separate problem sets for each of those individual tracks. We had lecture videos. Um, so I led the web programming videos. Uh, Tommy McWilliam, a former head teaching fellow for the course, uh, led the mobile application tracks for iOS and Android. Uh, and Colton Ogden, um, who runs uh, the games course at Harvard Extension School and on edX, uh, he led the game development track. Um, so we all prepared lecture videos, we all prepared projects, and let students pick what they wanted to do with their last two weeks. But how would you assess the end result? 
Uh, the end result, so there were, it was a good idea in theory. I mean, one thing we definitely found was that a lot of students just skewed towards web programming. Yeah. Web programming was like, I think, 80% plus of I think students. 87%. 87%, yeah, yeah that yeah. sounds about right. Uh, ended up choosing web programming. There was a smaller percentage for uh, iOS and games. And then I think there was like 1% of students ended up pursuing Android. In part, maybe because I think just based on <laughs> statistics at Harvard, almost everyone 99% of students have iPhones. Yeah, 99% <laughs> of students here have iPhones. Android is, for whatever reason, not super popular around here. No, but to be fair, in the edX version of the class and the open courseware version of the class for which these tracks are now available as of January 1st, I do think we'll see a lot more uptake of the Android track, to be fair. Yeah, I, I definitely agree with that. And I think it's a good thing that they exist for students who want to pursue them. But it was interesting that things skewed so heavily towards web programming this past year. Uh, and maybe that was just students from prior years that were encouraging uh, this year's students to do yeah. web programming because that's what they had seen before. Um, but I'm not entirely sure all the factors that might have attributed to to that skew. Yeah, and I'm not sure I'll admit that we should keep these next year. Um, I mean, 87% toward web is significant. Yeah. And there was a huge cost and time commitment, uh, not only of you, but of Tommy, of Colton, CS50's production team and the like, because we essentially mushroomed the last two weeks of the class into four times as many lectures and videos and problem sets and and trainings too. I mean, we spent a good part of October uh, asking that the staff ready themselves for not only being prepared to help students on the web track, but also one other track. And our TAs at Yale did the same thing. And that too is not without cost. And even then, though the TFs were moderately prepared to help students. The reality is that just by having done the web and the mobile and the games tracks themselves, the problem sets there for, doesn't necessarily mean they're comfortable with us answering questions that they themselves didn't stumble with or come across on their own. So support wise, this was actually quite hard. I mean, this is true of any change we make to CS50, whereby if we don't have the luxury of 80 staff members who previously talk, took the material the previous year, it's hard no matter what. But we definitely exacerbated that problem this year. It was harder to help students and we imposed more of a burden on a few of the staff who wonderfully stepped up and answered as many of the questions as they could. But it was tough keeping up with this. Yeah, definitely. And I remember a similar scale thing, though not quite as large scale, uh, when we made the switch from PHP to Python mm. in 2016, that that was a challenge for the staff too, that had never seen Python before, to learn Python in just a couple of months in order to get ready to work with students. But the difference there, I think, is the whole staff were all focused on the same material. Yeah. We were all collectively learning Python, could all turn on each other. Whereas for the tracks, we thought it'd be unreasonable to expect that a staff member in a month learn all three of the tracks to be able to work with students. Yeah. Uh, so we had each um, TF specialize in one of the three additional new tracks. And the result of that is that if you had iOS questions, there were fewer staff members that had yeah. done, done the track and were able to answer questions about it. Uh, so that was definitely a challenge too. Well, and I think we really felt it at the CS50 Hackathon, this all night event that we run each year during which students work on their final projects because we really, I think, noticed how many iOS and Android and games questions there were and how few of us during the evening, let alone at 2 a.m., 3 a.m., 4 a.m., were qualified and awake to actually help students. I mean, I was actually surprised too that 87% was as high as it was because the whole motivation for the introduction of the tracks was the hypothesis that there are a non-trivial number of students who take a class like CS50 for whom the course isn't everything they want it to be because it's trying to keep so many students, such a broad demographic of students on the same page. And so the tracks were an opportunity for students, we thought and we hoped, to sort of customize the course and tailor it to their own personal interest so they get more out of the course that's of personal interest to them as opposed to it being one size fits all. So in theory, we did put that structure in place, but surprisingly did 87% of the students lean toward the version of the class we long had. So it seems we somehow latched on to the, the, uh, the most popular track, certainly some 13 years ago when we introduced it. Yeah, and it may be, maybe part of this too is that like when I was doing the videos for the web programming track, I was basing it off of all of the work that you had done in past years on designing the lecture materials and the examples for demonstration in that track. So this is a, a track that's been around for a, a while longer, and so maybe that just attracted more people to it as well, whereas oh, you're the very iOS kind. track is newer. <laughs> but I do think it's worth noting too that the other challenge that we would have to wrestle with, even if we decided to keep these tracks this coming year, 
is that especially in the mobile world, the software stack and the technology just changes so darn fast. Oh yeah, it changes really quickly. Like when Tommy recorded those lectures about iOS, I remember reviewing them maybe a couple weeks later. And in those couple of weeks, Apple released a new version of Xcode, the tool you use in order to build all these iOS apps. And the user interface had changed from what was in the video. And so the button that Tommy was saying I should click on, it just yeah. wasn't there. And so. I'm sure within a couple of months, especially a year from now, things are going to change even more. Yeah, and not only the user interface, but some of the paradigms and the techniques or the function calls or the like, which means the material's got to be refreshed. And so there too, it's a vicious cycle. Whereas much of CS50's core, the first several, the first eight, nine weeks, as well as the web track are less sensitive to, I think, changes. But that's testament to the fact that it's meant to be an introduction to computer science, not an introduction to iOS or to Android or to game development or the like. So um, that at least is a core worth keeping. Yeah, and I think a lot of the other topics that CS50 touches have been around long enough that they change much more slowly. Like Python undergoes changes, but they tend to be backwards compatible for the most part. And so Python might have new features, but the examples from Python from last year or two years ago, those aren't going to break, even though a new version of Python is out. Indeed. And I am so glad a few years ago we decided, because we discussed this and debated this internally, should we go with, at the time with Python 2 or Python 3, since Python 2 was still pretty much omnipresent on people's computers. But we went from three, we, we went with three from the get-go, and thank God, because January 1st, 2020 came around, which is when Python 2 was officially deprecated, even though it's certainly still around. Uh, we didn't have to uh, stumble. Yeah, that's really nice that everything is just already Python 3, so makes it easier for us. Indeed. So that was 2019, a mix of successes and failures. And uh, invariably, uh, Brian and I and the team will be talking about these very same topics and ideas and new topics for the coming year. By all means, feel free to write us as always at podcast at cs50.harvard.edu if you have suggestions for future topics or feedback on this particular podcast and some of the interventions and ideas. By all means, please share some thoughts of your own. Definitely. Hoping to hear from you. This was the CS50 Podcast. My name is David Malin. My name is Brian Yu. And we'll see you next time. Bye, everyone.